The Democratic Republic of Congo should be one of the world's richest countries because of its massive wealth of minerals. But three decades of war have left a quarter of the population facing hunger, even starvation. So why isn't more being done to help those suffering in the DRC? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Six million people have been killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo over the past three decades. Millions more have been displaced. The conflict is escalating and atrocities are being committed on a massive scale. So why is the world ignoring what's being described as a silent genocide? This camp for the internally displaced outside the city of Goma is beyond capacity. 300,000 people have arrived here in the last few weeks alone, fleeing worsening violence in eastern DRC. The UN says more than 4 million people have been displaced by two years of sustained conflict between the Congolese army and the M23 rebel group. It's the latest phase in a war that has spanned three decades, involving more than 100 armed groups and several national armies with its roots in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. But it's also motivated by greed. The DRC is home to some of the world's largest reserves of precious metals and rare earth minerals. Militias, some backed by foreign states, battle for control of lucrative diamond and gold mines and use the profits to fund further conflict. Up to 70% of the world's cobalt supply comes from the DRC, it's a key component in the manufacture of lithium-ion batteries, and coltan, used in many electronic devices such as phones and computers, is also plentiful here. But none of that matters to the millions who've been displaced, like Asifwe and her baby, sheltering in the camp outside Goma. The health of my child is terrifying and stressful. She is in this severe state because she's getting very little food. Aid agencies are pleading for the world to take notice. People have been uprooted from their homes, from their land, not once, not twice, but multiple times. Don't give up on these people, don't ignore these people, and don't let this situation be tolerated. The Norwegian Refugee Council says armed groups have been attacking defenceless families. Women and girls are being subjected to sexual violence, and millions of children have been left without an education. And now, residents of Goma are in a panic as M23 rebels advance on the city and UN peacekeepers depart. The world failed to take action to stop a genocide in neighboring Rwanda three decades ago. Is it about to do the same again in DRC? Well, let's meet our guests. In London is Ben Shepherd. He is a consulting fellow with the Africa program at Chatham House. Here in the studio with me, we have Vava Tampa, He's a writer, activist, and founder of Save the Congo. That's a human rights group. And Ethel Tambudzai, she is a partner at PG Collective. That's a boutique consultancy firm. She's also a trustee at the Africa Center. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. I'll come to you first, Vava. You are Congolese. I am. Just tell me, why is there so little coverage in the Western media of this long-running conflict? People being killed and people doing the killings are black. Um, if the people who were doing the killings had been Arabs killing, let's say, black people, there would have been more international attention on the crisis. Um, if the people doing the killings had been white against black, there would have been also more international attention. But when you have the US and the UK giving guns and funds to a black man in Rwanda, Paul Kagame, to do the killings to continue to destabilize Congo and by extension the whole of Africa, and in doing so essentially preventing the emergence of that continent, then no one internationally speaks about it. That is the simplest answer. Have you been shocked over the years to see how little coverage it generates? I used to be. I think I've gotten used to it, unfortunately. Um, um, you see the coverage of other crises, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's um, what's happening in the Middle East, uh, or any other part of the world, you see the media paying more attention. There hasn't been no other crisis in the world that has killed more people, left more women 
brutalized, um, um, that has displaced more people and left 27 million people facing starvation than the DRC, but unfortunately, internationally, no one says a word. And in part because all those of us on this side of the world, so the British taxpayers, the American taxpayers, the people who are giving international aid, also the people who are funding the crisis. Ethel, is it too lazy to say that this is a conflict driven by greed over mineral wealth? DRC is extremely rich in resources. It absolutely is driven, I think, partly by corporate greed. Um, but I think it's also the increased exponential demand for minerals for the green revolution we're all, exper we're all experiencing or part of. And DRC, just for the record, is extremely rich in minerals. But as is always the case in Africa, the general population don't see any of this, do they? Um, I think, yeah, there is an unfortunate truth, actually, of what is going on currently in the DRC. Um, the cobalt minerals, lithium, are all in very high demand and are actually surrounding um, or surrounded by the areas of conflict. And these are all components of our mobile phones, mobile more phone. and more e-vehicles, electric vehicles. So there's a reason European countries and China make a beeline for DRC. There is a strong correlation for that, yes. Um, a lot of the lithium batteries, a lot of our renewable energy, solar power, solar panels, um, a lot of the renewable energy relies on a lot of the minerals that are being mined on the ground that are part of the conflict. Ben, the two sides of the conflict in the DRC, you've got the Congolese army, DRC army, and then we've got this rebel group M23 who seem to be very well organized and extremely ruthless. Uh, they are indeed, yeah, this is the second time the M23 has dominated um, the headlines on DRC and has caused uh, enormous suffering in the East. They, they first emerged in 2012 uh, and everyone thought they'd left the scene in 2013 when they, they were defeated. Um, their return, uh, I think, was a surprise to many of us who watched the DRC. Uh, the fact that they were able to take on and defeat the Congolese military uh, so comprehensively from a standing start um, I think indicates that they have had some assistance from over the border and uh, Rwanda's role in the violence ongoing there I think has been acknowledged by players including the EU and, and US in statements recently. And Ben, what's the game plan here for M23? I mean, ultimately, do they want to topple the government and take over or be installed as a, a puppet regime? What's the ultimate goal of M23? Yeah. It's a very good question. It's very hard to tell. Their uh, demands, um, in as much as they've made them in a coherent way, uh, have centred on uh, grievances of the Congolese uh, Rwanda phone community, so Rwandan-speaking Congolese, uh, largely Tutsi communities in, in a small area of North Kivu, which is just one of Congo's uh, 26 provinces. Um, they are around refugee returns, uh, around security. Um, but those are demands that have been in play for 20 years in the DRC. Uh, and the way that the M23 has gone about uh, what it's been doing has not suggested, at least to me, that they've been particularly serious in pursuing those objectives. Uh, underneath that, uh, they haven't uh, come out with uh, a political program suggesting that they want to, to overthrow the government in Kinshasa. Uh, they did the previous time they were on the scene in 2012-2013. That hasn't happened this time. Um, but I, I think the lack of a clear political and negotiated position from the M23 is one of the obstacles to finding a solution to it. Well, this is a 30-year conflict. Let's look at some of the key dates. So 1994 was the Rwandan genocide. The international community instructed the DRC, which was then known as Zaire, to open its borders to Rwandan refugees. Between 1996 and 2003, we had the First and Second Congo Wars. 5.4 million Congolese lost their lives. The UN deploys its first mission then to DRC. In 2012, the M23 rebels seized the town of Goma. The UN special forces successfully pushed the rebels back. And 2021, until last year, M23 re-emerged, seizing territory in North Kivu and closing in on Goma. Vava, from your friends and your family back home, when you speak to people, what is life like given what M23 do? 
Oh, it's awful on the ground. Uh, people are dying, children are facing starvation. When we talk about 27 million people facing starvation, it means people are having a slow death. But critically, what we must remember is the M23 could not have killed, raped, and displaced as many people as they have without Kagame, without guns and troops coming from Rwanda. In fact, the M23 does not exist. While the Congolese people are fighting is actually the Rwandan army. And critically, and this is significant for all of us, President Kagame in Rwanda could not have continued to, to fund and to fuel violence in Congo without receiving money and guns and immunity and punity from the British the Americans and others. So in a nutshell, if you actually look at this critically, the Congolese people are fighting. It's they're, they're not being killed directly by Kagame. It's actually, they're actually being killed by money and guns coming from this side of the world via Rwanda. Kagame simply is a puppet, like other previous puppets in Africa. Father, the last 18 months or so, we've seen the UK government really cozy up to Rwanda, wanting to send asylum seekers there as a third, a third country to basically be processed from. Um, is that why we don't hear leaders in the United Kingdom speaking out against Rwanda? But even before the current um, immigration and refugee deals, um, the British uh, po political system had a very much closer relationship to Rwanda than any other um, uh, government internationally. Reason why the British find it essential to continue to arm and fund a man, a government that the UN, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have said over and over, responsible for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and perhaps crimes of genocide, it's a question that you know, am amazes me. And you need to ask yourself, what do the, what, what the British get in return for funding and arming Kagame? What do we get in return as British taxpayers? That's a question which I think our viewers should be asking themselves. Ethel, I want to talk again about resources in the DRC. So I've read that the DRC finance minister claims that they're losing about a billion dollars a year because of gold and mineral wealth being smuggled out of the country and through Rwanda. So if you join the dots up, that's what's driving Rwanda's influence here, isn't it? Um, it plays a strong part in securing the channels, right, of transferring those resources out of uh, Kivu. Um, out of the DRC and making sure they get out of, into the, I guess, into the international market. How much of a tragedy is it for DRC that the wealth and the mineral resources seem to be plundered and the people don't in any way benefit from this? I think it's, um, it's a travesty. Like, it's beyond tragic, actually, because if we think about the development goals and what they stand for and what it means for um, the world, for Africa to do for itself, um, it massively requires a lot of international cooperation across borders with, you know, with GRC's neighbours, but also regionally, those, um, the region working in collaboration to support each other around security, around development. And the $1 billion figure that's been stated, that's the raw material value. If we think about what that looks like in the international market, once that's been converted to renewable energy batteries, it's exponentially more than that billion dollars. And Ethel... A lot of people in the Western world would consider themselves ethical and environmentalists. The mobile phones we use, the electric vehicles we drive, there are children mining these materials in the DRC, is that correct? That is correct. It's been proven by Amnesty and the Human Rights Watch. A lot of different international organizations have stated so. I mean, this is, this is terrible. It is absolutely shocking. Um, and I think it's, I think a big part of why we continue to support some of the organizations or companies that sell these products to us. There's a lot to do with greenwashing, right? We all want to do the next best thing to save the planet. Um, and how do you do that without being able to track supply chains? Um, a lot of the time, these minerals will be tracked back to Rwanda rather than the DRC directly, even though we can see that there's a direct correlation of where these products are coming from. Ben, the loss of life in the DRC has been terrible as well. But on top of that, we're seeing increasingly sexual violence being used as a weapon of war. Doctors Without Borders in October said that they treated an average every day last year of 70 sexual assault victims in the town of Goma. And in the North Kivu region, they reckon they treated 18,000 cases. 
in the past year. I mean, these statistics are absolutely shocking. They are indeed. Uh, there's been a, a humanitarian uh, disaster uh, beyond uh, all uh, appreciation, really, in DRC going on for decades. And, and very sadly, sexual violence has been a, a part of that. Um, through the Congo wars and into the, the period that's followed it, I think we have to recognize the extent to which communities in Eastern DRC have experienced trauma um, over generations now. Uh, there are generations uh, of young men who have been involved in, in organized violence uh, really for, from a very young age. Um, the brutality that, uh, that's become to some extent uh, normalized in military conduct, particularly in Eastern DRC, is going to take a very long time to unpick. But I wanted to, to, to fold this back into the, to where we started this conversation, uh, the, the narrative about, about sexual violence and indeed the narrative about conflict minerals. I think th there's a risk that we tell oversimplified stories about DRC and that feeds in to the way Congo is understood uh, and thought about in the international uh, media, in policy conversations. Uh, and it speaks back to the heart of darkness cliches, going back to Joseph Conrad. Um, and it, it in part means that the DRC often sadly gets put into a, a category of being too big, too complicated and too difficult, where things are not going to get better. And therefore it doesn't get the level of sustained attention, serious, uh, you know, grappling with the complexities of what's driving events and violence in, in the DRC, which is minerals to some extent, but is also uh, politics, uh, you know, local power, uh, land, issues that drive political behavior everywhere around the world. So my concern is that we don't put the DRC into an exceptional box and decide that everything's too hard. Um, the story of the violence in Eastern Congo is one that is incredibly complicated. Um, there are something like 120 armed groups active in Eastern DRC, which range in size from a handful of people to organized paramilitary groups. The M23 is one uh, and is certainly the biggest and most concerning right now. Um, but I don't think there's an easy diagnosis of why uh, Congo has been affected by violence uh, and finding answers to it are not easy. And if we circle back into simple narratives, I think it only reinforces that view of Congo as, you know, in inverted commas, and to use a phrase I don't like, a basket case. Well, let's just bring in Vava. I heard a sharp intake of breath there. Um, your country is a basket case. Look, I've seen Ben on his best days. Today, he's speaking complete flamingos. There is no credit or credibility to the argument he just advanced. Look, Congo, the current crisis is not being fueled by land or any, any, any such things. It's impunity. Okay, people responsible for the killings and the rapings are not being held accountable, you know, from Kagame to everyone else. That's the key element. So what to would you like to see? Who but, would you like but, to see come in? But the key element, just I need to complete this. When Ben talks about 120 militia gangs, that's again fueling a massive misunderstanding that you hear internationally. If you ask him to name 10, he couldn't be able to, to name 10 because it does not exist. What, you, what happens in Congo, to make Congo look bad, militia gangs, when the UN do their patrolling, they present themselves as, oh, we are called Vava Tampo, we are called James Kabarebe, also, and so on and so forth, and then giving this incredible you know, image of Congo being this country that does not function. It's a lie. We don't have 120 militia gangs, and Ben should stop advancing those arguments. And critically, significantly, what we all need to remember, the current crisis would not have continued if the British, if the American, were not giving President Kagame in Rwanda guns and money to continue to fuel the crisis. That's the key element. No natural resources, no land. And when the M23 talked about protecting the Tutsi, it's also critical to remember, I, I challenge Ben, I challenge anyone to name three massacre or violence which the Tutsi people in Congo have experienced over the past 12 months, which gives the M23 some credibility to claim that they're protecting the Tutsi people. It's a lie. Ben, what have you got to say to that? Apologies. I wasn't saying that those were things that I agree with. Um, I, in fact, agree with Vava on, on a lot of what he said. I don't think the DRC is a basket case. Uh, I don't particularly think that the Tutsi in Congo have suffered more than other Congolese communities. You know, all Congolese communities have suffered a great deal and under, under permanent threat. The point I was trying to make is that there are narratives out there on Congo um, that serve to constrain and dictate 
what is you know done in the international community around the DRC. They're cliches and they're often wrong. And I fully agree with Vava on that. It wasn't something that I was saying I thought. Um, but I think in terms of the way Congo is is uh, referred to and you know the, the discussions that we have in the media about it, um, my point was that we need to be clear about the complexities, clear that, that there are, in my view at least, there are no simple answers to, to finding sustainable peace in, in the DRC. Um, and, and that was it, really. I, I wasn't saying that I, I think those things. I was saying I think that is part of the currency of the international conversation about Congo. Thanks, Ben. Ethel, what would you like to see happen to facilitate the mineral wealth being used and sold and exported in a way that benefits the actual Congolese people? I think beyond the minerals, actually, taking a step back, I think I'd say going to the institutions, um, I think right now when we talk about the, um, the DRC, everybody doesn't really know where to start. Some people talk about the government. Some people talk about rebel militias, of course. And there's many different actors at play. I think strengthening of the institutions on the ground is really key. Um, but also enabling accountability to happen. If that can't be done at a regional level because of the conflict that's on at the moment, is thinking, well, what happens at the Africa uh, stage? What happens with the African Union? Who can take a role in coming into the space and being able to hold actors to account? Um, we can see at the international stage at the moment, I mean, the UN is under a, a lot of pressure, but also scrutiny around what's going on with the war in Ukraine and Russia, but also in Gaza and Israel. And actually, this con as you've mentioned, this conflict has been happening for over a period of 30 years, but we've not seen much international intervention in that. And I'm not saying we need that, but it's about, well, how can we start to rebuild or how can the institutions be strengthened to actually play a role locally and regionally now um, to better support what's going on but provide increased security. Fava, tell me about your president, Felix Shisekedi. Um, what's he like? What's his popularity like? A complete incompetent of president. That's my view. That's my review of him. Um, we are, I've talked about impunity. We continue to remain in this crisis, partially because of people like Felix Gisekedi. When he became president, one of the people he nominated, he promoted, was actually a deputy of a man called Bosco Taganda, who is today at the ICC. So when you have people which the UN, the US, the EU have placed under sanction for killing for mass killing, organizing mass rapes of women, looting natural resources, and then you have a president who's promoting them so that they can in turn, because he's promoting and protecting them, they then can protect him in return, then you find yourself in this crisis. So while the international community are playing a role in fueling the violence, in Congo, we have a government led by a man who is complete incompetent and does not have any legitimacy. That is the crisis, another crisis we are facing. Ben, give us your prediction for DRC in the coming few years, please. Well, I think Chisketi is starting his second uh, term. Um, he was re-elected in December of last year. Um, I think there's a, a window of opportunity um, to try and reset the narrative on the DRC. Um, I think he will have a couple of years to take that forward. Uh, the UN is withdrawing its peacekeeping mission in the DRC stabilization mission, I should say. It's, it's on a timetable to leave by December of, of this year. Um, it, it's been a long-term you know, prop uh, to the Congolese government. I, I think it will be a critical moment as and when that goes. And I think, as we've been discussing, the, the global turn to green transitions and the importance of Congolese cobalt in particular, but all other minerals as well, mean that the DRC is going to take an increasingly important place, both in the African continent and the global economy. Um, I think if, if Chiskedi and others can use the next couple of years to try and position the DRC to be able to take uh, you know, advantage of that and to provide some meaningful changes and improvements in the quality of life for its population, then I think we could see positive changes in the DRC. Um, there's a lot of hurdles in the way of that. In the immediate term, that is resolving the conflict with the M23. There's a diplomatic process ongoing, and I hope that succeeds. Um, but I'm not a Congo pessimist. I think, I think the future, with the right steps and the right support, could be bright for DRC. Ethel, if stability were to come to DRC and the right changes happen and the positive things happen, what potential has it? I think it has... Um, I think there's great potential for development on the ground for the population um, around education, around employment, 
um, around providing jobs for local people and the management of resources in a way that not only benefits the government and the local people, but I guess supports the green, the just transition that we speak of, um, I think requires a lot of different moving actors and a moving parts to take place um, from you know, the traffic, human trafficking and forced child labor towards what does secure employment and formalized employment look like? Ethel, Vava and Ben, thank you all so much for your insight on this roundtable. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.